and all of this is in the book. So I'm doing a, a TV that Geraldo was, this is when the, hey, the first beginning of talk radio. Right. And, and, and there was this argument about black folk, black folk and, and, and uh, talk radio, but there weren't a lot of black folk. And the program director of WABC, uh, Geraldo asked him legitimately, why don't you have any black folk? On, on, uh, on, in a New York, and you don't have a single black person. Uh, and he said, oh, well, we have to think about it. And then somebody spoke up and said, well, you do have a black person. And I can't remember the man's name now. And he said, oh, well, we don't think of him as black. And, and, and that debate is what sort of got me into Washington. Uh, and because the program director said, well, if they don't want you in Philly, we want you in Washington. Mm -hmm. But I did say this, I'm not going here and replacing another black. See, they have one black person. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and uh, I said, so if you're going to hire me and fire her, then I don't want the job because I'm not going to play that game. Right. Um, this is, and you know, it's, it's about sacrifice. And then take your platform, and, and you do this all the time. Go to a war zone in Sudan. I, I swear I asked, and Geraldo can be upset if he wants to. I've been in that war in South Sudan for, had gone back and forth at least six times. I kept asking people who had more resources than I had, come with me. Mm -hmm. I mean, he asked me, well, can we get in and out of South Sudan in a day? Uh, what hotel are we going to stay in? Excuse me, we're sleeping in the bush. It's a war going on. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, you know, he just walked away. Are you sick of... Mm. Yeah. Greetings. Hi. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good everything. Dr. Carr, how you doing? Oh, oh hold on. Hold on. You are muted. I can't unmute you. You're muted. I can't unmute you. All right, I was unmute. There that. you go. Who, who was that brother, that the handsome brother on there on the right with the so Oh, you mean Ro, Ro, Roland? Oh, oh, Joe Martin. So I mean, I'm I'm not in my right mind today. Uh so Grace is give me some grace. Uh that was you, Joe Madison. You, you get all the grace because Thursday I listened and then watched the clip that you posted of it on YouTube. And I don't know how you made it through that broadcast, quite frankly, given what you're well, about to talk about. Yeah. Um the book is radioactive. The man mm -hmm. is Joe Madison, the Black Eagle. Mm -hmm. um, today's episode, The Eagle Has Landed, How Do We Fly Without Perching? Thank you for uh, the title. Um, Roland Martin, of course, had his book chat with him. And um, Joe Madison was on Sirius XM before it was Sirius XM. Uh, he was on Urban View before it was Urban View when it was called The Power. Uh, he paved the way for me to be on the radio uh, at at that place and he made it possible for us to be great because he set the set the standard for what greatness looks like. So when I came into Sirius XM, my work wasn't so heavy. And I think um, as he made transition and I found out that morning, well, I actually knew before, but the family had to, of course, make the statement. And then I announced it on the radio. Um, I realized in that moment that there is a huge void that it will take so many of us to fill, which is good because we need many, many hands. And um, Laura Coates reached out because, you know, Laura Coates um, used to be on my radio show and no uh, for a year and change. And then when I got the reins of being able to program Urban View, uh, she was the first person I reached out to to have her own show at 10 a.m. following Joe Madison. She mm. literally was in the studio next to Joe Madison. She was literally in a bathroom when Joe Madison's wife was having a, a health episode and saved her life. Um, Laura mm. Coates now is on CNN, of course. But the the way in which we have bonded, um, so she's she called. She's like, "What are we gonna do?" And I said, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna keep going. Well, how do we honor him? Uh, we honor him by doing the work." And to his point, you know, there can't just be one. We can't be happy to be the one picked. If the next person, and I just look at, you know, from, I'm going to speak, uh, as I always do candidly, you know, there was Melissa Harris Perry. Then it was, uh, you know, she left. Joey, and then Joey, was Joey Reed. And then, and, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, the, and they, and they know that they can, 
replace and they us. They play them against each other. No question. I hate to say that. Yeah, they know they can do that, but no, but they can't do that when we have character. And if Joe Madison says, "No, you're not going to bring me in to replace somebody. I won't take the job. You're going to have to expand your your worldview." But that's what it requires of us, whether we're in corporate America and, you know, there's this one C-suite job. No, there could be. Why? Why should there only be one for us? You're saying that we are. We're, there's only one of us that's talented. There's only one of us that's good enough. There's only one of us. There's only one of us is we, we built the country. Matter of fact, the, the world looks the way it does because of the power of Africa. But you're telling me only one of us is valuable. No, 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 no. We have to change uh, the conversation, but we also have to demand and I know, you know, well, I'm not giving up that check. Then then you do what Roland did. You do what I'm doing. You create your own. Uh, we, we should never be dependent upon any one entity to deliver content, truth, facts, entertainment, goodness. We shouldn't be begging for a seat at the table. We have tools and weapons to build our own. And I threw in weapons. Uh, but yeah, we have tools uh, to build our own table because I'm I'm in, uh, I just was watching um, by any means necessary a documentary uh and um <laughs> it's got me like yes let's go let's go let's go let's go let's go so i was watching yeah. you and uh, you and charles uh coleman talking junior. about junior thank you absolutely um and in a minute we'll be talking about our, our friend and brother who i heard you in conversation with of course frederick douglas haynes the third <laughs> so but um you know, a point that Charles made was very important. He said, you know, coming out of in the captivity in the 19th century, our demand and and, and, and Frederick Douglass said that he said, you all are asking, what does the Negro want? What the Negro wants is to be left alone. You know, we'll get our tools. Uh, you pay us what you owe us, but you ain't going to do that. But either way, uh, we're going to build our own. And, you know, he went on to say, you know, well, I'm, uh, as you know, I've seen the conversation with you that you know, well, you know, we've kind of moved from that, you and Clay. And and no, I'm not, I don't think so at all. I think that there is a professional managerial class. That's a kind of term that's been bandied about in academic demi recently. A, a, a strata of black people who are comfortable, well-meaning, want the race to succeed, and want the race to succeed maybe one Negro at a time, beginning with the one that's in the mirror for them. And that's a quote from Charles Hampton Houston's father who actually said that. I want to help the race. I'm going to help the race one nigger at a time, beginning with this one. And that's a strategy. It's a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. Hadn't been very successful. I mean, makes for light, nice calendars in months like February, Black History Month, where you put the first nigger or the first nigger or the first nigger, all not worthless, but as worthless as you can get in a society where people are suffering. But what you raise is very important. And, 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 and I want to just take a second and, and acknowledge how you raised it. Because Thursday, I know, was it was a paradigm shift. It was a world shift. I mean, you know, the white press, the white commercial entertainment news press is not going to cover Joe Madison revealing their own deep immaturity and ultimately what's going to be the death knell for white supremacy in the world. They wouldn't think of themselves as white supremacists, but the fact that you didn't interrupt all of your broadcasts with Joe Madison tells us who you are. And the fact that so many of our people might not know, although so many, because of the house that Joe built, you know, as Reese said uh, Thursday night on Rolling Show, you know, she and Clay, you 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 bust up in D.C. and here's Sirius, and then on the other side, I across from her is Joe Madison. Anytime you walk in that building, you've seen him, the Black Eagle and guy. You, look, look at you can't get in his, you couldn't get in his wing without oh, permission. I went okay, I was like okay, and and you again, know. you know, it, it tells you what. What what can get done when you're so good at what you do? No it's question. undeniable. He had a whole wing. A whole wing. All right. And yeah. so we were discussing and, and shout out to Reese and you and, and Roland yeah. for you know making the whole show about Joe. Uh and Clay making his whole show about Joe and, and Lorie yeah. making his her whole show about Joe. Um and, and, and you, we're, we're planning you, something. You opening up. That's that's the only reason I, mean, I want you to continue. I, I just want to make make sure that we understand. And I can talk more about it later, but at that moment, as the news was breaking for the rest of us, you know, every, you know, Roland asked, you know, well, what's next? Where we go? And I said, you know, I raised your name and, you know, I mean, I'm in over the, both of these spaces, but you and I, we're building something that is very different. We're all part of this movement. And of course, Roland has built Black Star and, and it's a beautiful thing. And it too is independent. 
But he was raising that in the context of Joe Madison refused to go anywhere by itself. And so he brought everybody with him. And so there was no place to run, no place to hide when white folks tried to play that generation off against each other. And so I said, you know, Joe Madison's generation now yields to Karen Hunter's generation, Roland Martin's generation. And then Lauren Victoria Burke, the journalist, said, with Joe Madison gone, who got next? She said, I guess it's Karen Hunter. And I, and, I, and at that moment, I, I'm, I'm, I know you wouldn't, I'm just saying, I want to say that here because, okay. you know, we have a moment that, we got to figure out what to do. And, I'm going to just put it up. I know, I know you will. I'm not, look, look, well, I'm not, I mean, I wore, I wore past the baton today, right? Yes, because yes, because yeah, my concept, my concept is never who's got next. The game mm -hmm. that we're mm -hmm. in or what, whatever this is, and I, I feel like it's a cold civil war that we've been in here, yeah, but absolutely. globally, absolutely. right? Requires soldiers and generals in it. There can't be one person that, has next this baton that Joe Madison has left is mm -hmm. there are many of them littered about. There's he talked about the Sudan. He went to the, to a war zone during genocide and bought people out of bondage. Bought them physically. Bought thousands of human beings out of bondage. He went on a hunger strike for seventy three days. Yes, for voting rights. Yes, which we still don't have, by the way, codified while, in the law. While he, was, while he was sick with the prostate cancer the first time, putting his literal life on the line, and and, and before you go, on never, book, never stop being on the air during no, no. his chemo, during his radio, and oh, talked about God. it. How many, how many lives were saved because Joe Madison talked about it, and somebody went to the doctor? I mean, just <laughs> what you said. And, and as far as Sudan, and we can talk about this more later, but. Y'all saw a post, and we all probably saw the post. Many of us, uh, Cola Booth, the writer, yes, you know, yes, and it, yes, you know, yes, she yes. said Joe Masson came to Sudan. Of course, she's Sudanese. Joe Masson came to Sudan and purchased hundreds of Dinka, Shilluk, Noor, and of course, those that are the Nilotic people. If you want to know who built the pyramids, you can't go to Cairo. You got to go up the Nile, past uh, Aswan, into into Sudan with his Nubia. Those are Cola Booth's people. She said he came into Sudan with Dinka. Shilluk newer money, bought them from the Arabs at $4 a head, put them in trucks, drove them back to South Sudan and set them free. Kola Booth said, Joe, there's a quote, she said, Joe interviewed me on his show uh, six times. She said, this is before white folks decided I was a threat and that I don't exist. Joe, myself, Kola, and Danny Glover spoke at the Sudanese embassy and were able to save many lives. Joe Madison, Kola Booth said, is one of the greatest human beings I ever met. His empathy and love for justice was epic. That's from somebody from that region. So when you talk about Joe, May, it wasn't 100, it wasn't 200. I think the last, the, the official number they put was like over 7,300. But that doesn't count everybody else. What is he doing? And, and like you just played. Oh, Geraldo, you don't want to go Jerry Rivers? I'm sorry, Geraldo Rivera, once you got, you know. What the hell? No, there are many batons. But the reason I say, you know, in terms of passing the baton in that context, there are certain individuals that require everybody to work together. Otherwise, oh, it's yeah. a bunch of batons out there and people hitting yeah. each other over the head with them. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So, I mean, you're one of those big... Right, right, <laughs> yeah. Right, right, and the right, thing, right, you know, right. with that basketball, right. somebody's got to be the point guard. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or the team I, 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 I'll, I'll receive that because, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, yeah. this week, like a lot of highs and lows, Clay Kane's book, The Griff, came out. And Shout out to Clay. No question. So proud he was on The View. Yes. And I'm listening to him and watching him blossom and I'm, and I'm like, why why aren't people happy when people are successful? Do you know what I'm saying? It's like the joy that I feel. I'm like, how can you be mad at somebody? First of all, talk putting, it, talk I, know it, me, work, I know how much work he put into this. I can hear Joe Madison right now. Talk about it, Prof. Come on now. This is I'm what we got to do. Like, like, <laughs> you know, there, there's always this kind of like, oh, so, mm. you know, his success somehow diminishes you. Like, if you got light, nobody can turn your light out. Like, don't we want to make the world brighter? I'm happy. Let his light shine as big as it can. So he's on The View. I was so proud of him. And the book is doing well. And the book is good. I, you know, I read it. I had the first pages beforehand. No and, and I was like, this book, it, no, it's full of history and everything. And he put a lot of time in. And I was like, he deserves this. You know? Yes. And, yeah. and so I, I don't know how we can't be anything but collaborative and anything but working together when there's so many talented people out there. And 
if you have a platform, like Joe said, it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. I was watching Nikki Giovanni's um documentary last night too. What, what, what oh, my, oh my God. Um, well, I think a lot of things we'll maybe talk off mic, but I was I, I wrote down like some notes, and one of the things she said was, you know, our responsibility. Mute, mute it. She said, she yeah, said, our responsibility, our responsibility is duty, duty. And I was like, yes, yes, we, we are, we, we have, we only have this limited time here, but we have to be about something, right? We have to have like, we should be responsibility to make the world better. We have to, you know, like, so anyway, um, no, 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 I think this is the thing today. We have to have this conversation and it's, you know, Joe Mass is like, Mashariki Jawanza taking her last breaths and making transition on the last day of Kwanzaa, which is consistent with every day of her life. Joe Madison, the news breaks on the first day of Black History Month, consistent with sacrifice. What we've been talking about, you know, last week in office hours, and we'll finish up this week with uh, Dr. Du Bois, the revelation of St. Orgony the Dam, his 1938 Fisk speech. Sacrifice. Somebody has to sacrifice. Somebody has to sacrifice. And Joe Madison you know, when you come to me and say, um, you know, I'm going to let you interview or Nancy Pelosi. Well, I mean, Rowan told that story Thursday night. He said, you know, we were all trying to get Nancy Pelosi on the air, but she kept avoiding everybody. She avoided me. She avoided April Ryan. And so I told Joe Masson, April told Joe Masson, Joe Masson goes on his radio show and say, why are you ducking rolling? And then what happens? Nancy Pelosi's office calls Joe Madison and he gets the interview. He got the interview with Obama. And Ron's like, I didn't care who got it. One of us needed to get it. And therein lies the lesson. The whole point is if, if they're going to try to duck Karen Hunter, Karen goes on and say, why, uh, you know, somebody else says, well, why aren't you? But see, somebody gets it. But the point is this. Now we have spaces where people can run and hide. Shout out to Namrata Randawa and uh, Lenard McKelvey. Shout out. Shout out to them because they know where they can go and hide. There's no need to filter this. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to go to you because you're not going to say I shouldn't be the one. She should be the one. And that is how we lose. And because and Joe Madison's antithesis of that. Go ahead, please. I, I was going um, to reveal something. You know, I, I understood in order for me to be as free as I could be that I needed to duplicate myself in many different iterations. Yes, so, because uh, I know people, people, avoid, people avoid my show they, no they wanna, or, or they come out and try to be disrespectful and then end up um, revealing themselves Embarrassing. and then they right. come back <laughs> or, or I'm like, you about the BS. So I'm not inviting you back. Mm -hmm. But, but I realized that all of the voices, people need to hear everybody. So they may not come on my show, but they're going to go on clay, but they're going to go on Lurie. And they definitely were going on Joe Madison. They're gonna but go on theory, Reese. There's a standard. but it's all but it's all uh, right. But it's all our audience, and my it's job all. is to serve the audience. So if you don't hear it on me, you're gonna hear it on somebody else. And everybody's capable of asking questions. Every single person that has a mm -hmm. microphone knows how yeah. to ask questions, yeah. which is the standard because most people program to to lower the bar. I always said I said this to Laria and Clay. My greatest day will be when somebody calls up and said that they heard about me from them and that has happened because no that question. means that their reach now makes our reach collectively so much greater absolutely and absolutely. that should be and the goal that's the i agree and that standard can't be can't be lowered and this is another thing intergenerationally we've got to confront this society we live in now is absolutely committed to dumbing us down for consumer purposes, Joe Madison set a standard. You've continued that standard. That generational standard is being lowered unless you are deliberate. Listen to you and Larie on Thursday. And when Larie said, you know, Joe Madison curated the appetite. He said, you know, our people now have been fed. I think she referred to what was Larie? I know you and his brothers, hot Cheetos. Or we, we, our taste buds have been so destroyed. She said, so when you bring something, we can't taste it. It takes time to curate the appetite. And so as y'all were talking, it's like, that is it. They can't duck any, everybody that you brought and replicated and cross pollinization and things. You, you, you can't go on this channel and duck. 
So you're gonna have to go outside this ecosystem. And and those who rely on keeping us in a certain position in this social structure absolutely are aware of that. That's why they keep showing up in the places where the appetite is a hot Cheetos and Coke appetite. I mean, I can't come over here now. The, the, now here's the question for all those people who are, you know, pumping out the hot Cheetos. And I ain't gonna name nobody. Skip, skip. I ain't gonna name. But the point is this: when we, you know, have at that point, what is your obligation? Even if you can't resist the shiny thing in the street, which they know you can't. This was Du Bois talking about the golden apples of Atlanta. You know, the, the, the greed. Even if you can't resist it, it's still your responsibility to name check all these other people. I'm sure this isn't the first time that you've been invited to sit on a couch or to sit in the studio. I'm sure Karen Hunter, I'm sure Roland Martin, I'm sure whoever you name it, I'm sure they did. But since you came here, I felt like I had to call them. So I got some questions they wanted to ask you that I'm going to ask you for them. I mean, now if you stop doing that, when you right. now I know, but if you're not doing that, I really don't need to hear you because you're you're selling I'm, our people hot Cheetos. <laughs> you know I'm, anyway. I'm going to say something right now. You know who does do that, ironically enough? Stephen A. Smith. Stephen A. Smith will tell people, you know, if you want to hear this, you got to go to listen to Joe Madison, listen to Karen Hunter. He does this regularly. And I mean, because again, he knows what his platform is mm -hmm. and he also knows what we do. That is the assignment. And, you know, Leonard, you know, you don't have the chops to actually sit and, and do you think and, and the delusion of that, that you think you do that. And it's not even about being well read, which it should be though, you should be well read, which should you're not. No question. It, it shouldn't even be about your your intellectual appetite, but it kind of should be. But you don't even have the the time put in. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I, when when you say you know who's next, I can't be next for another 20, 30 years, Doctor Carr. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, and that. that's why it has to be because there's time put in. This man, like you mentioned, went oh. to do Sudan. Hunger strikes, walked in the streets, walked walked himself into bad health, like Dick Gregory. Yeah, he, yeah. Even, he even uh, is in the Guinness Book of World Records for being on the radio for 82 hours. Can you believe straight. that? Straight. Yeah, because I, was, I, I came in for a couple of hours. I was tired. I was like, man, first of all, you didn't. I don't even know how you do four hours a day. I do three and I'm tired. Hey, y'all, this I, is the mouth to ear. See, this is the difference between mouth to ear, experiential history. You're right. You're right. It takes all that time. You can't be next unless you've been alongside. This is what Jake Carruthers uh, mentions when he evokes Sundiata. When a, when a jolly shows up to be a historian and a memory keeper, that, that child came into the world with that task. So you've spent literally a generation listening and repeating. So when the elder makes transition, the next person in line has been in line for 25, 30 years. So I, I hear what you're saying, but it ain't somebody comes in on an oblique from the left who somebody said, let's disrupt this. That's what I'm concerned about. So when right. you, uh, anyway, I'll please continue because y'all were in the room no, together. I mean, this is the important that was, thing. That was the lesson. That was the lesson to that. So, you know, even when Laura and I were talking, she was like, well, maybe we can do, all of us can do 82. I was like, no, collectively we can do 82 hours. No one person can do 82 hours. And, mm. and we shouldn't even want to, you know, that was a standard set. We can collectively just show how, and it shouldn't just be Urban View. Now Laura's on another channel. Laura's on CNN. Right. She's on another. So now we got POTUS. Uh, John Fugel saying wants to tap in. Uh, we, no, it should be a complete Sirius XM because Joe Madison wasn't Urban View. He was Sirius no. XM. Sirius Urban View is the channel we all we all are on, but it's so yeah. much bigger than that. And in many ways, you know, Urban View is almost too small to contain what we what we do every day. But well, fortunately, we, we that. We're, still we're out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it all and it all comes over. And of course, you know, just mentioning in passing that in the process of that longest consecutive broadcast raised quarter million dollars for the National Museum of African That's American what I was going to say. It wasn't yeah. just a vanity project. Yeah. You know, people it wasn't an ego thing. No question. <laughs> How about that? How about that? Look, look. And then a few months later, shows up in Cuba. The first person from the United States of America broadcast media to do that in 50 years. And not because black people didn't want to go out there all along. Joe Madison kicked in the door waving the 4-4. No, I'm going. Y'all can't stop me. So how many people who have been there since have Joe Madison to think? And of course, if he was here, you know better than I do. You know, and those who aren't familiar, if you don't, you should get a chance and read his book, Radioactive, as he's talking about this at the time, the youngest, as we know, person to lead the NAACP in Detroit, which is, you know, all the Detroiters would say the blackest city in America. I'm not going to get into that Detroit, Chicago beef. I just say they both. Wherever I am, that's the blackest city. But 
you know, Madison would say, yeah, you see me, but what you really see is Dayton where I grew up. What you really see is Philly when I was on the radio in Detroit where I was an activist person who had a microphone. What you see is me taking, in some ways, the baton from Ralph Waldo, P.D. Green. I mean, what you see at WOL with Kathy Hughes and what you, when you see me, you don't really just, you're not looking at, like looking at you. You're not really looking at me. You're looking at us. That's what Anna Julia Cooper say. When and where I enter, the race enters with me. And that's the kind of person that you can't avoid because it's not one person. But it does that, take a person with talents, you know what I mean, to, 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 to no, think no, that no. way. I, I, I definitely believe that you, we should have the skill, the acumen, the the vision, because it requires that, you know, when I first came to Urban View, it was always about how do I build a bridge from Joe Madison to me? Because I'm at three, he's at, he was six to ten. In between that, there people should be able to stay on the channel and get fed and led and fed and led to get to, to three. I need to build a bridge and then I need to up my game. I can't just come in and dial in. I have to be oh, able to God. meet that three, that, that four hours in the morning so that no one ever feels like they, they aren't getting what they paid for. You know, so that was always the vision. How do we duplicate this? How do we, and, and my thought was always, all right, up next, the re up next. <laughs> Clint Kane, stay tuned for the you know just, like that. Listen to y'all talk. I mean, just you and Larry just on Thursday. I think you know as you brought her into that space, as you said you were going to do last week when we were all here on Saturday to to kind of push the center at Mega Evers and then just the string of names, Alton Maddox, Esmeralda Simmons, who is a pure whole beast, the founder and director, you know that sister who is just like let me. But Larry is not talking about herself. People attract. Like, as you say, that the, what is a uh, Sunday? I'd always say that the I'm in your vibe attracts your tribe, and then iron sharpens iron. You know, when you haven't had the chance to be in conversation to build something, when you are in you encounter those kind of people and you come away enhanced and re energized to do more work, and you realize, what have I been doing? Because this society absolutely is invested in preventing those kind of things but it can't stop the energy so you've overflowed serious at this point i mean this is this oh, yeah. is a you know what i'm saying this is a, just like joe madison did but you overflowed so so all of um, us together all of us together oh you know, i know we're gonna keep doing that but the reality is you know the commitment that we have not just to one another because it, it is evident but to everyone who is listening it, it it sometimes it makes people so uncomfortable because they can't trust it because it, 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 there's so few places where you can go where people aren't trying to, to you know, and there's always a skepticism, like, well, you know, what's the angle, you know? And the angle is freedom. Understand you know, it. Here, here's a reality. You know, I'm good. I'm whole, complete. I ain't got to do none of this. So Understand so it. I get up every day wanting to do this. Saturday, I don't get, I don't get paid to do this. This, this. this is a labor of love. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, there's, yeah. there's no monetary value to this for me. But the value is so much greater than any dollar or dime could ever be. So, so this, if you if you can get up with that burning desire to do this in your heart, and you know people because we get the praise reports, you could be sitting in the Panera, somebody coming up to you, you know, people in the Everything. airport, sure. you know, like look at it, they, and they know what it is when they see each other. Do you know what I that's, mean? That's the return. The and that's been less than narrative. less than five years, Doctor Carr. We have oh, built no. a community. Of people, no but it's been more than 20, 30 years because this has kind of been the life's mission for me to interview one of your students uh, oh. who's on Bass Reeves and, and talk about Laura you. Laura Wood, Laura Wood, as a North that sister was always that talented. And that child showed up 18 years old at Howard University Fine Arts. And now here she is telling a story, helping to tell a story historically that she knew before she took the role. I mean, so I mean, that you're right. That's the thing. You know what I'm saying? That's well, you. That's you. But I'm I'm just saying the, the cross the cross pollinization and the right. commitment can't be denied, but it's time put in. So that's the thing too. Do you it know Joe, Joe Madison used to say, you know, the difference between a movement uh and a moment is 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 sacrifice. Oh. Right. And so the, the that's it. So so for us, you know, being here every Saturday, um, mm. 204 Saturdays on yes. on unstoppable even though i've been trying to like can we pair back can we do no nope, we need nope. to, yeah well we got to figure it out we got to figure that out because you're right if everybody does a little nobody has to do a lot and that and that includes the two of us and and yes it, it's you know you talk, people talk about leaving it all out on the field sports metaphor for sure but you know that's why in thinking about this week 
you know, th there's a quote, it pretty, you know, common quote from Things Fall Apart, uh, Chino Achebe's 1957 novel. And, um, you know, the continental Africans, the Igbo people are being assaulted by these British invaders and uh, things fall apart itself is taken from a poem. But there's a line in there uh, where one of the characters says, Ineke the bird says that since men have learned to shoot without missing, he has learned to fly without perching. You know, we live in a society where People, you know, we talk about self-care. We talk about um, making sure that we sustain the soul that serves. And all those things are essential. But we don't live in a society where those things. And this is just my, you know, as young people would say, and not so young, me, myself, personally. You know, I think people say, well, why would you say the three? No, that's like an Ebonics. It's like a phrase. It's almost like jazz. Me, myself, personally. Me, myself, personally. Me, myself, personally, I don't subscribe to that. We're born, we're going to die. Joe Madison making transition after the prostate cancer came back. and You know, he had talked very openly and candidly about his challenge and battle and probably saved a lot of lives, saved untold lives. Certainly in the wake of this resurgence, you know, I reached out to some of the people I love and admire and value. You know, I, first person I reached out to was Dr. Reba Kelsey, who's at Morehouse School of Medicine. I know Reba, that's where she went into medicine. Her whole family is about that. That's Reba Kelsey's daughter. So, you know, she she sent me the, the, the newest updates. If you're a black man, you need to go to the doctor, get tested. And after you get to be in your 40s, probably needs to be annually. That's the latest information that Dr. Kelsey shared with me, Dr. Reba Kelsey. And so, you know, we don't know how many lives Joe Madison saved by, by, by doing that. But you know, Joe Madison flew without perching because the society that we have been born into, the social structure we've been born into, uh, these people learn to shoot without missing. And by these people, I mean, not just the individual racists. This is the lesson. And again, as you say, iron sharpens iron. I want to uh, lift my students in the Hattahal University School of Law, this critical race theory. Now we're going, we'll be going into week five next week. Uh, you know, if we live to make it to, to Wednesday. No day is promised, as Muslims would say, inshallah. But, you know, they have been pushing me week after week after week as we kind of just devour these these, these readings and, and, and just push the conversation further and further. And one of the tenets of critical race theory is you know, this idea that liberal racism, because critical race theory has a has a critique of liberal racists and white supremacists who don't think they're racist. But of course, we see Martin Luther King did that, as we all read together here in Nubia on the Nubia side of this. When we read where do we go from here chaos or community last year critical race theory says you know one of the ways that white supremacy is able to evade confrontation with the system its systemic nature is to say that these are individuals it's not systems so you can name you know maga mike johnson and the cruel agenda of the white nationalist core of the Republican Party and the federal legislature here in the United States, you can name Donald J. Trump. It's easy. You can name Jerry Lawler. I'm sorry. No, Randy Macho Man Savage. No, wait. What? Mm -mm -mm. Oh, yeah. Marjorie Taylor Greene. And, you know, the kind of hate based virulence, you know, and, and so forth. You, you, you can do that. You can talk about the shovel mouth bastard governor of Texas, Greg Abbott and the cruelty. Uh, it wasn't Jamal Bowie. I think maybe Adam Harris at the uh, at the Atlantic said, you know, the cruelty is the point. That's easy. That's low hanging fruit. We saw this week that the president of the United States scrambling to try to rescue Michigan from uh, problems he going to have in the general election in 2024 this year. Uh, it says, you know, I'm, I'm going to ban uh, access to their bank accounts and their financial um, resources for some of these uh, settlers who have committed acts of violence in the West Bank. I said, well, you're going to ban the whole Israel Defense Force? You're going to slap your friend Benjamin Net Netanyahu around and take my tax dollars away from him? You're not going to do that. So what you're going to try to say is it's just a few settlers over there. So four, 
that they've 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 restricted access to and still these people who are open supporters of settler colonialism who have so much blood on their hands now that we don't count in the tens and the twenties and of course we we talked last week in an office hours about three people uh, young people of well two young people 23 24 the brother was in his 40s uh, who would whose remains were just returned to dover delaware yesterday uh, who lost their lives over there because they were army reservists out of georgia three black people um but you're not going to attack the system because you're part of the system you're going to make it look like you're attacking something by uh, looking at the most extreme examples that the out, most outrageous examples you can come to and say see we're doing something but nobody's fooled in dearborn nobody's fooled in in michigan where it, and it isn't just the arabs sir it isn't just the muslims sir it is now thousands of people in churches in the united states of african descent and we are well aware not as aware as we should be but we are well aware that there are problems that you have helped foment you and your friends from the uk and the eu you and your friends uh with the oil companies and the mineral companies you and your friends who have fomented and fostered conflict in places like central africa congo in places like west africa mali uh, sierra leone and uh, niger which of course have now withdrawn from the economic community of west african states ECOWAS. And we don't know which way that's going to go. We know that you have four minute problems in places like Haiti, where the Kenyans said they were going to intervene. But the Kenyan high court said you can't send our troops over there because that, too, has been four minute. And it isn't what it seems on the surface. We know that you have four minute rebellions and four minute chaos in places like Colombia and Chile, places like Brazil. Uh, which a year ago we know that you know some of the most egregious white nazis tried to, to, to destroy the, the capital of brazil in the wake of the swearing in of lula da silva so we know you've done all that we know you've done all that but when it comes time now for you to try to maintain control of the political apparatus as we talked about last week over half the world is in election mode in uh, in the world over half the people in the world live in countries that will have elections this i think nicaragua you know that's or take uh, guatemala maybe i think uh has their election today or tomorrow but at any rate you know when you want to maintain control of the political apparatus here in the united states then you know now you want to jump on four settlers in the west bank when it's a whole institutional formation that's the problem and the structure that's the problem because you're hoping to rescue michigan because you think if you can appeal to the muslim americans in michigan you can get their votes back and you can scare them with donald trump well they, everybody should be terrified about what, what the white nationalists would do when Derek donald trump comes back in office if he gets back in office but you can do two things at the same time sir you can be pushed and the fact that you're going there at all, the fact that you've uh, singled out these four at all means that the pressure is mounting on you. And make no mistake, it ain't just the Arabs in Michigan. It ain't just the Muslims in Michigan, of which Rashida Tlaib is one who holds John Conyers, uh, seat, the seat John Conyers had in the federal legislature. It isn't just them. It's them black people in Detroit who go to church. It's those black people in Atlanta, they go to church. The long article in the New York Times last week, uh, shout out to Barbara Skinner. Uh, who helped lead that coalition of ministers who have gone to the White House like, look here, man, look here, this got to stop. Cease fire now. This is not just the United Nations now, Gutierrez. It's not just uh, the countries of the world voting in the General Assembly. It's not, and you can't block this. You can't block the church, uh, Ambassador Greenfield, Linda Thompson Greenfield. You can't block the whole black church. Black people are clear. There is no we. But a we can be formed. And the question we have to ask ourselves as we's form in response to clear cut issues of moral right and wrong, regardless of where we are, we are well aware of what's going on in Africa. We're well aware of what's going on in Africa, the continent and the children of Africa around the world, whether they be in the United States, Caribbean, Latin America, Europe, Asia, or anywhere else. We're well aware of those things, generally, even if many of us can't give you the specifics and we have to aspire to that command that would allow us to talk as freely about what can be done to assist African people and those who are oppressed around the world, we should be able to speak as freely about that as we can give you the details of the Meg versus um uh, Nicki minaj beef we, we should be able to do that but we can't and that's the standard we have to hold ourselves to 
and those who have gifts like Martin Lamont Hill or, you know, my, my, my dear friend and brother who can speak all up to all of those audiences and tries to do it simultaneously. I'm too old and frankly don't have the investment to try to do it beyond what I can do. I teach the hip hop class at Howard and every every class we have is we're going through the history of hip hop. We're going through the, the political, social, economic context of how it emerges in the 1960s and 70s in Jamaica and in uh, the, in New York. And then globally, we were putting all those conversations in. The stuff that happened this week and the last couple of years and when these young people who were in college now were in high school and junior high school, well, yeah, I'm abreast of that enough to be able to have it as a point of entry, but I'm linking it to a larger context of Africana. And in that process, when we get into that moment and, to, and making those linkages, they have to lead. They are the classroom authority because that's what they're consuming every day. But, you know, that's not my job to translate all of that, because in a moment, as I pause here and take a breath. See, I'm not going to get those three seconds back. or. these three seconds meaning that i don't have enough time to sit to parse through lyrics in a beef that may or may not be contrived i hope uh while folks who can tell you every element of that beef can tell you every element of the beef i wonder if they saw this week's new yorker which i'll turn to just for a second in passing uh this long oh, article by john seabrook the next scene and, and i wonder if anybody knows who this is i know we all do this of course is sir lucian grange the chairman of ceo of universal music group you understand umg trying to eat the world i'm sure y'all saw in the paper uh how they just pulled all their music from tiktok and how now the content creators are scrambling to see should they go to instagram or youtube because umg is like yeah uh we got some issues with licensing and at the end of this long article in the New Yorker, this is what he says. This is the guy over Universal Music Group. So while y'all talking about beef, I asked the students Thursday, I said, now what y'all going to do when Nikki and Megan show up on the duet track? They're not going to do it. No, no, no. See, y'all don't understand. Y'all don't know what a 360 deal is. We'll get to that. We'll get to that in class. We'll do that. Dr. Carr, does that, does that man make any music? Does that man make any music? Can he? Is he talented? He's the master of, he's the master of music, isn't he? I mean, it's the whole point, right? 360D, we ain't gonna talk about Lyra Cohen, Cohen, but yes. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, Prof, you jump back here, man. I just wanna read the last part. This is the last paragraph. The last time I spoke to Lucian, Bono told me he was going on about Africa. It's so exciting. By the way, if you haven't seen the We Are the World documentary <laughs> on Netflix, it is hilarious. I don't know if you've seen I'll, it yet, but anyway, I'm thinking about- I, I, keep, I keep not clicking on it. I don't know why. Like, I just <laughs> keep saying. I, I, I mean to, but I'm going to tell you what saved me. And see, again, this is why this is where intergenerational is so important. This is why you bring in these young people to curate and have this conversation. This is why Joe Madison always, I'm looking at the next generation. I'm bringing them in. You know, so I rely on these students. They hadn't seen it, but I tell you who I saw it. My teaching assistant, Miss Carter, Angela Carter, who everybody who went to Kemet last year, y'all know Angela, she was on uh, the bus with us, the blue bus. But at any rate, she watches everything. She's finishing her dissertation now, which is about Motown and Philadelphia International. She's in psychology. She's using the African States framework to analyze lyrics. And she's got these young people reading these lyrics and talking about social justice. Anyway, so she's got these academic chops and she's a master teaching assistant. I wouldn't be able to manage without her, frankly. So, but she's from Philly and she watches all that stuff. All the stuff you be sitting up watching, Angela probably watched it too. So the two of y'all cars would be very innocent. But she said to me, have you seen this documentary? I said, no, I ain't seen it. She said, I watched it. I said, what you think? She said, I couldn't stop laughing. And then she started talking about it. I said, she doesn't laugh at stupid stuff. So I said, okay, let me watch it. And I couldn't stop laughing. My, Stevie Wonder busting up in the studio talking about, okay, I'm ready. They said, what you mean? The song is done. Lionel Richie and, and, and Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson, the song is done. We tried to contact you four months ago. He's like, what? And so you can see him like, okay, I'm going to sing, but damn, I could write the song. Dude, you should answer your phone. But Stevie Wonder, like a lot of us, no, you got to send somebody to me. You can't leave me no voice message. I mean, it was so, you know, look, Bob Dylan shook because we all know Bob Dylan can't sing. But now you're in the room with Tina Turner and Dionne Warwick and Jeffrey Osborne. So you got to figure out how you've been. Because this ain't, hey, hey, hey. no, hell no. This is something else. It's just fast. And listening to Lionel Richie talk about Michael Jackson doesn't play instruments. 
he hums everything. So when we're trying to come, well, that's what he said. You know, Lionel Richie got it, you know. But he says, he's doing these tapes. We don't have anything. And so I'm listening to him. And as he's humming, I'm realizing this is so layered and complex. Now, he, of course, he known Michael Jackson since he was a kid. But he says, we're in the room and he's coming. And then I hear, I'm like, what the hell? And he said, out of the corner of this room, I'm in Michael Jackson, a snake comes out of like the books or something. He said, I don't, and Michael Jackson said, oh, I've been looking for you. He came out in response to the him, Lionel. And Lionel, you see, see how you laughing? I'm telling you, this whole thing is just like, oh, okay. I'm serious right now. Anyway, okay. I'm, only bringing it up, I'm only bringing it up because just as they're getting ready to record, because they got one day to do this. In fact, that's because they all came to the, uh, I think it was the American Music Awards. Lionel Richie won all these awards. Prince is sitting there. He gets in his feelings. That's why Sheila E is there, but not Prince. I mean, it's, it's all kind of thing. But they get there, and just before they start recording, Quincy Jones brings in Bob Geldorf. And it says, he's going to tell y'all why we're here. You know, I was in Africa, and I'm thinking to myself, hey, man, this is great. And I saw the little star turn you had in the Freddie Mercury Queen vehicle, Bohemian Rhapsody, where you raising money and, 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 you know, yeah, but damn it, we don't need no saviors in Africa. Just like Coleman said to you, oh, we need leave us alone. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So Bono, back to the article, Bono, Mr. Save Africa, he says, the last time I spoke to Lucian, this is the guy running Universal Music Group, Bono said, he was going on about Africa. It's so exciting. All these new artists. He was looking at talent in Nigeria. By 2050, more than a third of the world's youth will live on the African continent. When the African music scene came up in our conversation, Grange got so worked up that he seemed like he might pogo off his chair. Quote, a dance hall record coming out of Lagos to an old fart talent scout like me? This is wonderful, end quote, he said. His ears were up, final quote, because their scenes. And then they start to cross-pollinate. It's the greatest feeling when you've placed a song with an artist or you've seen a band and there are 50 people, then 150 people, then 300 people. It's the greatest feeling in the world. That's why he's doing it, Prof. Not for the billions, but for the greatest feeling in the world. And he got Africa in his sights. I, it's, it's, uh, I know you got some thoughts about this. This is where we yeah, are. I, talking I, about a couple of things. Um, Nikki Giovanni in, in that documentary, um, mm -hmm. was it? to the... Black women in Mars or something. I, don't, I forgot the title, but I'm gonna call it the Nikki Giovanni yeah. documentary. Something about Mars. It's, yeah, it's like really profound. Mm -hmm. it, she got in trouble, which I didn't know. She was she was canceled because she was challenging all of the people with the South Africa divestment. Yes. And she was like, uh, if you put that energy on the places here that we need mm -hmm. help. And she said, it feels very performative. So you get arrested. And you're in there, you book 30 minutes, you're out, you're out in time to watch Joker's Wild. <laughs> and what has changed here? And so, you know, she even challenged, you know, people like Harry Belafonte. Okay, that's nice. That's nice. But what are you doing here? And and, and the media, doing? yeah, the media converged on her, like not in a mm -hmm. good way. And um, and I thought it was very powerful because they keep going to Africa. Um, they keep colonizing and they keep extracting and they keep you know it's happening all over again just well, now it it's not hold of ships and chains it's it's right it, it never stopped never stopped. the bird said since these people have learned to shoot without missing we've learned to fly without perching but somehow we've forgotten sacrifices at the card of this i mean joe madison i mean and it's interesting nikki giovanni say that you know, the famous uh, conversation between Nikki Giovanni when she's very young and James Baldwin is it going back and forth. And people hold that up as a model of intergenerational dialogue. And I agree it is. I also agree uh, with myself <laughs> that there <laughs> is, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> with that, it, well, with myself being the self that has spent a lifetime and will continue till I stop breathing, listening to people who know better, who have had, different, everybody's had different experiences. And in my mind, what has congealed is a consensus that is that you speak differently, you, you're in conversation differently the more you know. And to listen to the two of them in conversation, for me, is a reminder, as was sitting through the movie Origin uh, last week, uh, for that matter, that, you know, having read the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, which I think is a deeply, mm, uh, which 
is an important introduction and should be a very important urging to people to really study the relationship between race and caste, racial capitalism. And, you know, anyway, I'm going to get too deep into that. But listening to it is a powerful reminder that for African people in the United States in particular, there is this nativism that has grown uh, kind of in the bosom of too many of us. And, and we talk now, this is governance talk. This is us talking about who we are to each other. And it informs a kind of centering of race in a way that is not helpful to human struggle, not as helpful as it could be. And what do I mean by that very specifically? You know, I think James Baldwin, one of the most brilliant writers that humanity has produced over the arc of the last century. And I frankly have never been, I have to choose my words carefully here because I want to say what I mean. I don't want to be misunderstood. I think that Baldwin may be like everybody else who speaks publicly, who writes publicly, who communicates publicly, maybe misused sometimes around this concept of race. I don't think James Baldwin saw from what I've read of him and encountered with him, saw the artificial boundaries that we call states and countries as barriers or impediments to the human spirit. But I think often he is used by nationalists, not white nationalists, although white nationalists are good for using black people like Martin Luther King, but I mean nativists to talk about the maybe the perfectibility of the American project or the possibilities of the perfectibility of the American project. And, and I'm like, no, 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 no. These states, which are shells, placeholders for economic and political power, which are not respected at all by the movers and shakers of the world, the Elon Musks of the world, who don't even respect the states. I know, Prof, you saw this week. Uh, I think if I put the Financial Times from uh, earlier in the week here, let me see, for Ukraine. Oh, yeah, here we go. This was... Um, this was Thursday's paper. Here's Elon Musk with Tesla, which is now being valued at about around a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. Says um, Tesla's board agreed to offer Elon Musk a payout of up to $55 billion. What did he pay for Twitter? Was it 44? But they don't use, yeah, he, but he don't use his money, right? But they get no, ready to give, no right. they, no they give him a check for $55 billion if the electric car maker hit sky high performance targets. This was six years ago they agreed to do that. Well, once the one of the goals was for Tesla to hit a market capitalization of six hundred and fifty billion dollars, this battery company posing as a car company. Anyway, uh, again, strategic minerals out of Africa, always something new. At the time, it was fifty nine billion. Yet, despite its value at one point topping one trillion, it now stands at five hundred ninety six billion. Tesla chief Musk was left venting his fury on social media site X this week after a judge in Delaware ruled he must forfeit the pay deal. That was on Thursday. Now, if you've been following this a little bit, you may know that, let me see if I have it here, what Clark Peters doing with the paper. Oh, here we go. This is uh, the next day, Friday. Musk calls Tesla vote on shift to Texas after Delaware <laughs> court voids pay package. He don't like what the judge said in Delaware where Tesla's incorporated, so guess what? He gonna get the shareholders to move the headquarters to where much of the other stuff is in the United States operation to Texas so he can get him a judge to give him his $55 billion. People who think that these lines that we call states in the United States or countries, that these lines are real, are not paying attention to the social structure. The, the people who hamstring themselves are the ones who respect those lines more than the people who drew them because people who drew them didn't draw them to keep people apart except so that they who never fall apart can control everything. And as long as they have learned to shoot us without missing, we got to learn to fly without Pershing to sacrifice. So when Nikki Giovanni says, what about the people here? Well, with all due respect, Elder, uh, they are attacking Africa and Africans. You are an African. And you know that very well. Your body of work shows that. Your brilliant body of work. We, we can do two things at once. And I think what happens is this social structure foments this kind of nativism. This is the American descendants of slaves argument and the foundational black Americans, which I understand, I understand the pain, the trauma that's born of it. There is no moral argument. Nobody's going to give you anything in the world. Certainly not your master who you seem to love. But at any rate, 
I mean, I understand when you're whipped enough, you can love your master. It becomes a, a kind of thing. But, you know, you you can do two things at once. Queen Mother Moore, Audley Moore is a great example of that. This sister born and raised in Louisiana, Garvey, you New York. She said, you know, everybody should confront the government of the place that we are in. At the same time, we have to connect with each other so we can coordinate that attack because we are one people. These are not two separate things. But the way we have been curated by people who depend on that separation because they themselves are not separated. I was Bono, I was just talking to him. He's, he's in Africa. Why? Yeah, because I done done the math and a third of the young people about to be in Africa in, in Nigeria 2050. So therefore, I, I need to be over there. Now, you need to stay here and argue about whether uh, David Oyewolo is playing Bass Reeves alongside Lauren, uh, uh, Lauren, mm, 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 I'm just Banks. tripping now. Banks. Woods, Banks. 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 That's Lauren Woods, Banks. Lauren Banks. Yeah. Lauren Banks, you seem to want to argue about continental Africans coming to the United States, taking roles that we could be playing Cynthia Revo and David Oyewolo and, you know, Daniel Kaluuya. Okay. Absolutely. And no, I think that there perhaps, I know there's some Jamaican actors that could be playing Bob Marley in this latest propaganda that they're going to pump out with the young brother who was in uh, Peaky Blinders um, and in uh, Secret Invasion. I forget his name. Somebody will put it in one of the chats and I'll be able to look at it in a second. But if you don't find the first prof, he's about to play Bob Marley in this in this um, Bob Marley chase them crazy ball heads out of town docu uh, uh, biopic. Wait, it's not. No, what's it called? Kingsley, his name is Kingsley Ben-Adir. Kingsley Ben-Adir. Yes. Brilliant actor. Good young brother. It's not it's not Bob Marley chase them crazy ball heads. It's uh, Bob Marley redemption song is the name of the no that's not the name of it either what's the name oh yeah bob marley one love what y'all trying to do to bob marley we know what you're trying to do it's plenty of footage of bob but what you want bob marley to be is a universal figure who's not coming out of the boba shanti not coming out of the rastafari not coming out of the confrontation with white supremacy old pirates yeah they rabbi Sold out to the merchant ship. I'm sure you'll have that in, but you, but you're trying to get to the tourist industry. One love, come to Jamaica and feel all right. That's not the original lyric, but that's what the tourists would have. Carnival Cruise, you you know, and we talk about that in the hip hop class too. How you know, uh, Lee Scratch Perry destroyed black art rather than let it fall into the hands of these interlopers, and uh, how uh, Peter Tosh was like, I don't even call him Chris uh, Blackwell. Uh, Island Records again under Universal Music Group. No need to talk about conspiracy. I call him Chris Whitewell. I mean, y'all are sucking this out of us. But I'm saying, I'm saying all that to say this: when we think about sacrifice, and when we think about the the bridges that have to be built, and we think about the intergenerational conversations that have to be held, when Nikki Giovanni, who is aware of all that, who has worked internationally, has done all that kind of work, when documentaries, you know pull out pieces to curate a kind of vision and, and, and bring that to the fore, it, we run the risk, if we haven't continued to study and be in conversation with each other globally, we run the risk of reinforcing the things that keep us divided at the exact time that we must come together. Because perhaps that criticism would have fallen on Joe Madison, who did not hesitate to go to Sudan, literally purchasing people back for $4 at a body. Joe Madison, who was heavily involved in the anti-apartheid movement, or Randall Robinson, who got arrested. I don't think that was performance. The hunger strike is not performance. This is sacrifice. And both of those men have been on sacrifices. Many of the people who got arrested in front of the South Africa embassy booked and released. Absolutely. And I know that that's not what Nikki, Nikki Giovanni at her heart and in her work represents. But I know that when you can curate a narrative, to keep us separate, this feeds those who say, I don't know why they worried about them over there. What about us over here? Guess what? Both. You can do both. You can do both. And so, you know, here we are, the first week of February. And of course, this is Black History Month. So, you know, the, you know I put my car G. What's in the Academy of Black Studies. Shout out to my people at Dunbar High School, Nubia Garima Rogers and her people over there. Um, you know, this is the moment as Dr. Woodson said it should be the short period of time when we study what, where we celebrate what we have learned the whole year. This isn't the only time we talk about it. And we've talked about that. We've got several 
of those installments of in class and a lot and we read the miseducation of the negro line by line in nubia and it really was revealing in the reread for a lot of us as much as it was for the first time some people had read it it's an important thing but whitson had that sacrifice he put his skills to use for the people coming out of those coal mines in huntington west virginia coming out of those coal mines where he could only go to high school at frederick douglas high school in west virginia when he was 18 years old, somebody else family from West Virginia, Prof, that you talked to this week, whose father named, uh, grandfather named himself Frederick Douglass, uh, on the western side of the state. Woodson was enslaved, uh, his people were enslaved on the eastern side of the state. His parents were enslaved, he wasn't. He was born in 1875. But he worked in those coal mines, and then he went to Frederick Douglass High School when he was 18, finished in two years, went to Berea College in Kentucky, eventually the University of Chicago, Harvard University. All these degrees were just to arm him to fight. But I, I want to linger for a moment on West Virginia because it was somebody he was talking to who named Frederick Douglass too. <laughs> like Car G with the school Car G Wilson went to and eventually came back and was the principal of, but I can't for the life of me. What? <laughs> oh, it was our friend Freddie Haynes, wasn't it? What, what, you was talking yeah. to Freddie Haynes the day you talked about Joe Madison. Tell us about that. <laughs> I, I, I want to pause, pause for a second and we're definitely going to move forward. <clears throat> Part of this exercise, you know, as you assess the 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 art and it is art that that is put out by Hollywood we have to be critical critically thinking about why why this narrative as we literally live in a world that has been built on myth making from the the cherry tree to this one not telling a lot or this one you know and and it's all kind of very very uh one dimensional there are no yes. nuanced conversations. And now because we don't do the deep study and we don't read, we are just, you know, a TikTok away from having our whole life view be um, rooted in lies. Right. right. And then we, we and we protect and defend the lies because part of that means if I have to give up the lie, then I have to start all over again or I have to do more work or I have to do something. Right. Part of that sacrifice. Right. If I give up the lie, then I'm maybe not who I think I am. And I, I just want to encourage everyone. It, it's okay. You know, whoever you are, one thing Nikki Giovanni said is that, um, you know, this life is about growing. I'm not the person I was in my 20s or 30s, and I shouldn't right. be, shouldn't want to be. We should she, always she be. Was in her 20s. Let's be very clear about that. Nikki Giovanni started so young. If y'all never heard the album, Truth is on its way where she's got that choir. And Nikki Giovanni is a gift to us. I'm sorry. I just want, but wait, yeah, absolutely, wait, that, absolutely. That, that poem about killing, I oh was like, God. oh, oh, yeah. Let me, I, let me, I was like, <laughs> I was like that. yeah, yeah, no. And we, yeah. we might need to do something newbie on that because we can't do it publicly. But that, you know, <laughs> but for many of us, and I, and I and I challenge myself too because, you know, it's like once you find out something, a lot of us get angry. Like, why didn't I learn this in school? Lean into it because if the more we know, the more we can contribute, the more we can engage, the more we can challenge each other and then hold that up to the light, see if it's true. Like it's okay. Truth should be the goal, right? Dr. Carr, I mean, My it should God. be the goal. We shouldn't want to be comfortable in our lives and our myths, whether it's our family lives or the country's lives or the world's lives. Yes. We should want, we should always be yes. seeking the due north of truth and it's okay. And it will mean something that you will have to do something. You have to change. That's going to be uncomfortable. Um, but it benefits all of us. It's okay. It's all it's right. Okay. I mean, you know, okay. so I just want right. to say that, but yeah, no, 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 it's, it's okay. And it's all right. Yeah. Because I mean, like Michael Jackson said, you got to look at the man, the woman, the person in the mirror. And of course, Michael, Michael Joseph Jackson, who wrote many of his songs as the story, uh, Quincy Jones likes to tell about how, the, the stalkers was after him and his brothers and the lady came and said that Michael Jackson was the father of one of his, one of her twins, uh, which was apparently one of the, uh, <laughs> the inspiration uh, for him to write Billie Jean. But of course, one of the great lyrics of the African songbook in the United States, be careful what you do when the lie becomes the truth. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, Michael Jackson, you're exactly right. You, it's going to make you uncomfortable. It's not, we're not doing mathematics. This is not math. Yeah. This is culture. Cultures bleed. Cultures are messy. There, as John Clark said, in some stories, there ain't no good guys. I mean, you can be great and bad at the same time. This is, so yes. I mean, so, but I mean, you, um, I, mm, please. Fred, Fred uh, Frederick Douglass Haynes III mm -hmm. um, gave me oh. a moment this week 
uh, on his way to his installation, the yes. day of his installation, I, yes. I reached out and asked him to come on, you know, thinking that he would be too busy because he had, you know, there's a lot. Of, and he was like, yes. And he stayed for almost an hour. And sure oh. I had to I had to have this conversation with him because you and I have, you know, gone down the rabbit hole with Rainbow Push before that, before Rainbow Push, the Rainbow Vision of Fred Hampton, another Fred. And, you know, I've had some very strong feelings about Jesse Jackson, but in an avatar way. But, okay. you know, preparing for my interview with Frederick Douglas Hayes III, I'm like, Jesse Jackson did a lot of things that were really important. And so I asked him, how do you reconcile with somebody's personal foibles and personal failings? You know, and, and we tend to toss out the baby with the bathwater. But we need that bathwater and the baby, maybe. You know, maybe we need both. I don't know. But he, you know, he explained to me, and not just great. Water. Cause... So wh why is there bath water? We absolutely need both. <laughs> yes, we need the bath water. So, no, you know, so I had, to, I had to sit with that because I you know, I tend to be hypercritical because I'm like, man, pastor, babies, you know, huh, cancel. <laughs> why is this we person are, in leadership? Are. You know. And then I was like, but the work, though, the work that none of us were willing to do, you know, nobody's nobody's unflawed. We're all nope, flawed. Nope. We're all incredibly flawed. Nobody oh. is perfect. Ha. Ah, oh. OK. Oh. And whatever was done wasn't done to me. So why I got opinion about it? Do, he do it to me. All right. right. So listen, um, but the work, though, can't be denied from the boycotts of pick. Pepsi and freaking Anheuser Busch and KFC that then right. brought jobs yeah. and things like I'm, I mean and that's just a little bit. And I'm not even talking about the hostage, uh, you know, negotiations and all of the things and the mm -hmm. legacy that Frederick Douglas Haynes the third the 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 programs to educate people, the programs to 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 look out for folk who are incarcerated. I mean, there was so much there. As I was doing my research, I was like, I, I got convicted in the moment, so I had to ask the pastor. How do we how do we how do we hold space for these two things like this incredibly flawed human being who also did all of these great things that we must pick up the baton and continue? Otherwise, we will discard the work. We'll discard the work because of the the, the failings. Right. It's what we yeah. do, actually. So so no I'm going to do better. I just want to make well, that confession. And, and let me let me join you in saying that very same thing as, as you raised uh, on Thursday with, with our brother, Freddie Haynes. Um, you know, he's very close with a son to Jeremiah Wright, and we all have to do better. You know, I I, I owe Baba J a, a call for probably two weeks, and then I, I should just do that today. I'm going to say this in front of all these people for in perpetuity. I should do that because I'm constantly running, but that's no excuse. We all just kind of, you know, stumbling through this life and trying to be very deliberate, and if everybody did more of a little, no one would have to do a lot. And sacrifice can become almost an albatross. Sacrifice can come a become a debilitating thing. You know, Woodson, as we talked about in several of our sessions now, you know, Woodson never married, never had any children. Woodson uh, was beloved in his community on 9th Street here in D.C., Northwest D.C., the house now run by the National Park Service. Shout out to all my friends and family working with the National Park Service and all the rangers that known over the years and hope to continue to know uh, when Joy Kennard was running that 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 area, especially, you know, now she's moved on. Uh, she went to Charles Young's house in Ohio, then to Tuskegee, and now has moved on um, back here, I think now, the uh, Museum of American History. But Dr. Kennard, whose father started the Anacostia Museum, John Kennard, the first African-American museum, the Anacostia Neighborhood Museum in the Smithsonian family. I think it was 1967. But at any rate, Woodson made great sacrifices when he made transition, as we talked about many times. And I won't go over this again. The people who knew him best were the people who were farthest away from the academy, farthest away from these institutions. You know, we know Constance Baker Motley will be getting a, a United States stamp today. Um, when you mention a Constance Baker Motley, you think about other incredible women of African descent in this country, names, there's so many names, one of which would be a very close friend with Dr. Woodson, Mary McLeod Bethune, the founder of what is now Bethune Cookman University and National Council of Negro Women leader. But I raised them because they knew what uh, Ms. Bethune knew Woodson, Dr. Bethune knew Woodson. 
But who knew what's in the best were the children in the neighborhood who would go over to his house where he worked as well. That's where the headquarters of the association was. And he'd get them ice cream or take them around. Or the sisters who worked it, who lived at the Phyllis Wheatley Y, the YWCA, which is still there, right across the block from Carter Woodson's house. Now on the corner where Benjamin Banneker Academic High School is, the new Banneker building. And those sisters knew him because he would come over there and regale them with stories when he taught in the Philippines. And we talked all about this, so I won't go over it again. I just I mention it because Woodson's pleasures were hidden from most people in his life. Woodson would travel to Europe. Uh, Charles Thompson, a uh, longtime dean of the graduate school at Howard University and founder of the Journal of Negro Education, where a lot of these people were published, Sterling Brown, Ralph Bunch, so many others, Murs Tate, the great Murs Tate and others. Um, new book on Murs Tate, by the way, is excellent by uh, our sister Barbara Savage at the University of Pennsylvania, Murs D. Tate. I don't know if I have it here in the stack, but excellent book. She's been working on it for years. Uh, Murs Tate, the great internationalist, the great scholar. In fact, um, I almost wish that um, maybe Isabel Wilkerson had read some more Murs Tate before she. Anyway, not a problem. Got to understand how international systems work and before you say it's not racist cast. You know, both them things were anyway. Not a problem. I'm not going to get into cast or origin because the filmmaking was excellent. You know, shout out to Ava DuVernay. I mean, well, just a beautifully filmed uh, film. I think the, the the source material, however, could leave people watching that film with, with, with a wrong idea in their head. And that, too, is part of a process. We're all learning. So I won't get too deep into that. But uh, as I said, Charles Thompson who published Murr's Tate and all them in the Journal of Education, knew Woodson for years, and he encountered Woodson in, in France one time, he and his wife. And Woodson was like, hey, y'all want to go to dinner? Okay, so the next day they went to dinner. Woodson took them to this little French restaurant upstairs in this little building and had curated a seven-course meal with wines matching each course and all this kind of thing. And, and Thompson was like, Nobody in the restaurant spoke any English. So Woodson's having this whole conversation with the waiters and the chefs and everything in French. And, and then as they're leaving, it dawns on Thompson. This is what Woodson does for fun. He doesn't do it in the United States. He goes to Europe to do research and go to museums and stuff. And he eats. This is what he does. So when Du Bois writes Woodson's obituary, which I actually have the, the original copy of Masses and Mainstream when he published it in 1950, he said, you know, by the end of his life, he had gained a lot of weight. He was he's overweight. Yeah, because Woodson didn't have a lot of pleasures. One of them was eating good food, and he didn't do it in front of y'all. Sacrifice sometimes when you see people. That's why sometimes when you see people who you know sacrifice all the time, and you find out the thing that gives them pleasure, you should just leave them alone and then let them enjoy that. It's a beautiful thing, or, or, or help them. But anyway, the point I want to raise is that in this moment of February, we're talking about sacrifice. Because Du Bois said in that same obituary for Carter Woodson that there was no one person who did more to advance the study of our people by singular effort, by a life of complete sacrifice than Carter Woodson. And as Carter Woodson, uh, as he writes of Woodson in that obituary, which was the opening line of Black historians in the historical profession, uh, the book by August Meyer and Elliot Rudwick, which uh, chapter one, Carter G. Woodson as Entrepreneur, which is the book that really got me untracked when I was, this is around 1990, the fall of 1990, actually, I went to the library, and checked that book out and ended up having to pay the fine because by the time I got through writing on every page of it, I didn't want to give it back. So uh, I just, y'all buy another copy. This is my copy now. I was at Ohio State. I didn't feel bad because I got more money than God. Shout out to the uh, indentured servants who make all that money for Ohio State on their athletic fields. But at any rate, as I was reading that, the first quote in that in that book, in chapter one, is a quote from Du Bois on Woodson, where he says, Carter G. Woodson, who died April 3rd in Washington, D.C., 1950, who just passed, he said, the life of Carter G. Woodson shows you what race prejudice can do to a human soul and what it is powerless to prevent. Sacrifice. Joe Madison, you think if Joe Madison didn't have to be what he was, what would he have chosen to be? In other words, if he didn't have to learn to fly without perching this black eagle, if he didn't have to learn to fly without perching, what would he have been? Uh, we'll pause here and lift uh, our sister and mother, um, 
Ife Carruthers, who uh, celebrated her 80th birthday. Shout out to her daughter, Mark. Son, Tawa had a beautiful convening yesterday. We were all on Zoom with a surprise for her. I don't know how Tawa did that. That's my sister. I don't know how she did, but how you keep this from your mama? Because she know everything. But Mama Ife was there. They all, you know, surprised. Everybody's there from around the world. You know, family is there. Everybody's there. And one of the things that was revealed to a lot of people was that, you know, she's, she's a master teacher, lifelong teacher, um, a pillar of ASCAC. Association for Study of Classical African Civilizations, pillar of the Institute of Positive Education, the Comedic Institute, so many other organization formations. And in her job that she got a check for most of her adult life, she's a school teacher in many different places, high school in particular, historian and a history teacher. And one of the things that was revealed was also an alum of Tennessee State. That's my that's my Tennessee State person. A few few years before me, but you know, we all bleed blue in that respect. She said, you know, if I hadn't been a teacher. I'd have been a concert pianist. And when you think about black people, what would you have done if you didn't have to do something that involves sacrifice for the rest of us? And people want to believe that you can have it all. You can't because you don't get any of those breaths back. And sacrifice can be a painful thing. It can also be a beautiful thing. And it can be a thing that feeds you, as we have read over and over again in every one of these speeches W.E.B. Du Bois makes. I don't know what I did with uh, the book. I had it here and then I put it down. But at any rate, I may have put it at my feet. And you know I'm obsessive about it, so I'm going to keep looking until I find it. But there it is. Um, you know, when Du Bois in the education of black people and in the one that we only read the first part of, got through the first part of on Monday, we'll finish on this coming Monday, the revelation of St. Ordney the Damned. He talks about sacrifice. Thou shall forego. Thou shall sacrifice. We have to sacrifice in order to move everyone forward. And Joe Madison did that. And part of sacrifice meanings, means finding others, as you've just talked about, Prof, and as you talked about through this week, well, every day, but in particular in the, in the wake of the passing of Joe Madison, the idea of doing it in community community focused in that idea and you talked to me as you were talking even the reed were talking you know you, you talked about and then uh freddie haynes reverend dr haynes you know this question of it is intellectual work as you say because it involves thinking and it's focused in sacrifice and now we're in a moment where keeping people separate and disconnected or keeping people clustered together by their personal interest and then using that as some kind of kind of almost cause don't say cosplay although i just said it it's not quite cosplay it's almost like a performance of sacrifice you know i think about you know and i, and I you know I'm, I'm a reader so i'm reading all the time and i look at some incredible work being done and i think about it in terms of people not being able to um to translate that into what it means in the world they're chroniclers you know, a lot of academics are chroniclers, but it's like now. So what is the meaning of that for you? Or as Joe Madison would say, as you reminded us and reminded us on the Nubia platform, when you put that in uh, on the page for today, Joe Madison asking, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And so, you know, it, it's very important to understand that. And, and that gets passed on from generation to generation to generation to generation in an unbroken genealogy. This is the work of Sheikh Ante Jope and so many others. And this is what Jacob Carruthers was talking about when he opened uh, his important speech on truth and falsehood that he gave at the United African Movement. Yes, that same UAM in Brooklyn at the old slave theater where uh, Alton and Leola Maddox uh, curated that. And the community there in New York did it. And of course, it makes me think about Esmeralda Simmons again. They're right there in Brooklyn, right around the corner from Mega Everest. All right, Larry. I, I love that corner of New York for all the all the all the reasons um, that you can imagine. But anyway, at that speech, Dr. Carruthers opened with Sundiata. And he remembers the first lines from the Jolly who says, this is the story that was given to me by my father. And it was given to him by his father before him and was given to him by his father before him. I am a Jolly. I am a memory keeper. Lies are foreign to us. Because what comes out of my mouth must be exactly the thing as it was passed down and as it happened. That is my responsibility. That requires sacrifice to be able to sit with that. Not when you are 22 years old. Now you want to be one. No, when you were born, as Asa Hilly reminded us when he went to Timbuktu and they took him into the room that they did not take Henry Gates into. 
Uh, I see Dr. Professor Gates is now meddling around with gospel music after having done the documentary on the black church. I'm sure I'll watch the documentary very closely and read the companion volume. All very important work as points of entry, but you can't stop there. But uh, Gates, when his Wonders of the African World documentary, where he roamed around Africa in a Harvard T-shirt and uh, violated protocols like uh, going to Ethiopia and asking them, demanding to see the Ark of the Covenant and, you know, asking people, do they feel bad for trading Africans? And, you know, what about your role in the slave trade? You know, mischief makers are very important. And it's no um, accident that Henry Louis Gates first came to the imagination of a lot of people in terms of dealing with African people. Uh, from his book, The Signifying Monkey, where he writes about his shoe and how his shoe survived the uh, the passage. Um, I think in some ways, uh, Dr. Gates, uh, brilliant brother, a lot of very committed, important work, but you have to listen very closely to Henry Gates because there's almost always this underlying theme of clowning Black people in a very sly way. Uh, but at any rate, um, so I see he's, he, he, he's talking about that kind of stuff now, but he's not a jolly. So when Asa Hilliard, came into Mali after Gates had been there and they show Gates some of these old books that they had in Timbuktu and Gates is looking at them. Yeah, he's kind of thing. Now, of course, Harvard comes in and helps digitize. They're helping the black people. We're going to digitize. Now you got it. And Okay. And so here it says, I was in the region shortly after, not even, I think, a matter of months, maybe a matter of weeks. And they said, yeah, we showed him this room. Now we're going to show you something else. He said, meet these young people. Who are they? These are the next generation of what we would call librarians, bookkeepers. But you're so young. Yeah. When they are born, they were born into a family. That family's job, these families, this cluster of families, their job is to be the librarians. What? Yeah. So when a child is born, as the child is coming out of its mother's womb, they cover the child's face. And they take the child into a room with some of these books. And then they lift the cloth. Why? Because the first thing that child should see on this side of creation is the thing they're going to be responsible for for their entire lives. So when you pass a baton, if you're honored enough to have been born into a family where that is the charge, that is a sacred obligation. It's very difficult. It's very difficult because that, that kind of thing is something that this society can help you reject. You might not want to do that. And you have a life, you can make a choice. We don't live in those kind of societies anymore, not completely. There are burdens. I mean, of course, you know, Dexter Scott King, who had to take over the King Center because his siblings simply weren't in a position to do it. He did the best he could, and he did an incredible job. Before we talk about We Are the World, we can also talk about the King Holiday uh, song that he helped curate because his interest was producing in music. And so, you know, New Edition and the Fat Boys and Run DMC and Whitney Houston and Menudo and all them people he brings together around the King Center to do Celebrate and gets Prince to pay for the music video because he couldn't make it to the recording, but he actually said, well, let me pick up the tab for this. You know, Dexter Scott King has a story there who was ahead of his time on intellectual property. And as his sister Bernice said from the podium at the King Center uh, last week, you know, I'm going to continue in my brother work because he saw it before the rest of us saw it, intellectual property and how it's important to get control of that. I mean, everybody makes sacrifices and nobody is perfect, but thinking about that in the context of these bridge figures intergenerationally, when you come into a genealogy, if you're blessed to be born in one like Freddie Haynes, you can reject it or accept it or reject some of it or accept some of it. Looking at Freddie Haynes and, and, and there's no better person to have been installed to lead uh, Operation Push, Rainbow Push, an organization that came because another young person, Jesse Lewis Jackson, was invested in responsibility with Operation Breadbasket by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And it's not without its tensions. It's not without its fractures. We're talking about human beings, after all. With Freddie Haynes standing there with his daughter, who's my student at Howard University, his, his wonderful wife and partner there on the stage on Thursday. And, you know, and of course, Roland is there. Roland Martin is there as part of the people, one of the people who paid tribute. And he brought all his cameras. So you can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it. You can see that installation and the ministers who speak and, and everyone who else who speaks. You know, it's very important to see this clustering of people. But then when he was talking with you on Thursday, probably about the fact that his father, who was a titan out there on the West Coast of San Francisco, where Freddie is from, for his father's father, part of Woodson's people are in the eastern part of what becomes West Virginia. Freddie Haynes' people are in the western part of West Virginia, where his grandfather names himself Frederick Douglas Haynes. 
then Frank Douglas Haynes Sr., of course, then Jr., then Freddie Haynes, now the third out of Sumner, Summers County, West Virginia. And it's very important to understand, at nine years old, going to school, becomes the first person of African descent to run, the, uh, run for county supervisor in San Francisco. And in his position in San Francisco, as they relocated to the Pacific Ocean, in conversation with W. Du Bois and, and Paul Robeson and Martin Luther King and so many others. And you ask yourself, okay, my grandfather is in conversation with these people. And then my father, and now me, and I am taking a baton that was passed that I was prepared for from birth, from a man who was brought up and through into this movement to whom the baton was passed. Did he grab the baton? Did he yank it? Did he elbow somebody else out the way? Probably uh, more than one thing can be true. But at the same time, he got the baton and when he got it. If you've never seen Jesse Lewis Jackson's speech at the 1984 Democratic National Convention with Rosa Parks sitting there and Coretta Scott King sitting there, Jimmy Carter, all these other people, and he's sitting there and he's standing there saying, you might see me, but you don't know my story. Ooh, I, guess I get chills thinking about that. I was 19. People say, oh, Democrats and Republicans are the same. Your mouth, but please, just a little, be quiet. Just long enough to listen, said Jim, as the ancient Egyptians would say. Because by revealing that type of, uh, by saying that kind of thing, many things can be true at the same time. In a duopoly, absolutely. In a, in a political economy where you've got soft white nationalists, as the critical race theorists would say, the liberal racists would say this is individual acts, but it isn't really the soul of America. That's a bold-faced lie and it's demonstrably false. You can absolutely say that. But when it comes to the daily lives of black people, this is a different kind of conversation. You think Joe Masson loved the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? Joe Masson was an African fighting for his people. We'll use whatever tool we need to fight. And so watching Jesse Jackson in 1984, at a time when it wasn't no cable, when TV went off, there's no internet. So we're all watching. And most of the people who fought those knockdown drag out battles in the 1950s and 60s are still alive. And enough of the people we recognize, the Rosa Parks, is, were sitting in that convention center when Jesse Jackson stood there with his family and then gave that talk, our time has come. Jesse Jackson, whose security for that campaign was the Nation of Islam. Now, you talk about a place where a lot of things can be true at the same time. And you can say, ah, well, I don't agree with fair kind of, who do you agree with all the time? You don't agree with yourself. Or you don't agree with what you just said came out your mouth. But you said it, didn't you? The whole point is this. And then the Secret Service like, well, shit, the nation out here, this is too much. Well, you know, Jesse Jackson lived around the corner from Farrakhan. And Barack Obama lived in that neighborhood. All them there in Hyde Park, Chicago. But the point is this. Well, Barack Obama didn't live there in 1984. He's still trying to, you know, get his life together. But the point is this. You got to intervene now, feds, because these Negroes, you got a black nationalist, lightweight pan-Africanist pan when you go back 12 years before that to 1972 and the National Black Political Convention in Gary, Indiana, Richard Hatcher, the black mayor of, of Gary, of course, home of the Jackson Five, uh, hosted. And you see the, the opening night of the convention, all these black people from around the country here to, to put together a black agenda and Coretta Scott King and Betty Shabazz sitting side by side opening the convention. See, it's the problem. They try to they try to keep black people separated. Betty Shabazz, whose, whose, whose husband, slain husband, Coretta Scott King, whose slain husband, both of them visited Palestine. Both of them visited Africa. John Lewis met Malcolm X in East Africa while he was over there on a trip that Harry Belafonte and them put together where they went to West Africa and East Africa. Y'all stop trying to separate black people because when you open your mouth, you've shown that somebody has curated your taste for hot Cheetos. Come on, Larry, you absolutely right. And when somebody put some clean glass of water, you don't even want that. Give me something with some sugar in it. I need something with some kick in it. Why? Because the Universal Music Group is pumping this in my brain and I need to consume something that somebody else sells and they make that much more money off it. I don't even want that nasty water. So Jesse Jackson in 1984 is a flawed human being, just like Greg Carr and just like everybody else. And he sacrifices and he puts other people in the mode of sacrifice, some of whom didn't sign up to be sacrificed for. He got to work that out with them people and they got to work it out with him. We all have to work that out. But when he stood there and said, you see me, but you don't know my story. Well, I knew his story that day. Because that's our story. And you can't stop him because if you could, you would. And then in 88, 
when you got even more delegates and you don't want a lot of these states and you go into Atlanta and we can really change the whole Democratic Party. And then the night before you give up all the delegates to a failing candidate, Michael Dukakis, who gets steamrolled in the election, we took that as a betrayal. To this day, I take it as a betrayal because that's not what we were trying to do. So four people say the Democrats and Republicans are the same. Please understand that some of us were there. And everybody was there if you choose to be in terms of your generation, but it is the intergenerational work that links generation to generation to generation. And you have to understand that there will be tensions. But as those tensions emerge, they can be resolved by agreeing in the words of Mariba Kelsey, Reba Kelsey's father, let us agree to agree. We've got some common goals we have to put together to have a we in the first place. And we might be in a moment as a species, as a people of African descent within that species, where we might be at the moment where we have to determine whether there's going to be a we, because after this, we may never again be able to determine as before that there will be a we. Let me kind of wind this up. Thinking about that in the context of the, what we face in terms of the social structure. You know, I'm constantly thinking about this Africana studies framework. We're going to wind up um, the education of black people, our book, after we finish this week, the revelation of St. Orgny the Damned. We have three speeches left. These are the three that Dr. Du Bois did not uh, select in his lifetime uh, and that Herbert Aptheker, the editor of the book, decided to add the Future of the Negro State University in 1941, a talk he gave at Lincoln University in Jeff City, Missouri. Um, the 1946 commencement speech at the great Knoxville College, the future and function of the private Negro College. And then finally, uh, just an astonishing speech, really, an astonishing speech that he gave on April the 2nd, 1960 at Johnson C. Smith. Shout out to Dr. Catherine Adams, Kathy L. Adams. Kathy, this is your alma mater. Golden Bulls, I believe, isn't it? Shout out to the CIAA. April the 2nd, 1960, Wither, Now, and Why. 92 years old. Du Bois paints a picture that we are still grappling with today. Um, that's right, Debbie. I'm looking in the Nubia chat. When, when questions came about political party support, Joe Madison used to always quote, no permanent friends or permanent enemies, only permanent interests. Let me look over here and see, do I see Bill Clay's book on the Congressional Black Caucus? Yes, no permanent interests. I mean, no permanent friends, only permanent interests. That was the motto of the Congressional Black Caucus, which who were also present, many of the members at the meeting that the ministers had with the Biden administration on this question of a ceasefire. We've got to be able to do several things at once. So as the technology as the interaction of science, and technology and other categories kind of come together, we have to understand finally in the wake of the passing of Joe Madison. That the media has shifted. I don't know if you all saw this week in Florida. Uh, this is from one of our black newspapers. In fact, flagship black newspaper here in Washington, D.C., the Washington Informer. You see the Informer. There's a great article in here. Shout out to Denise Rollart Barnes, uh, the daughter of the founder, Calvin Rollart. Uh, genealogies who keep this paper in print. My man Sam Collins and the other writers here, Stacy Brown. Um, the National Publisher, a National Newspaper Publishing Association, uh, had their midwinter meeting about a week ago. They, they wrapped it up in Florida, where there's Ben Chavis and others who are here. And it's a powerful reminder that people don't read newspapers like they used to. People looking at websites, but they're really scrolling. They don't, they don't linger to read the newspaper as such. Many people don't. That's one reason why I continue to subscribe to the terrestrial newspaper, because I remember, I remember when that was the only option. And I never want to forget. Why? Because we are living now where in a period where Joe Madison would not look like Joe Madison if he was starting out today. There is radio, but it's satellite radio. Karen Hunter can reach the entire world the galaxy, the universe beyond, because we have been loosed from the terrestrial radio station as the place that has a broadcast range beyond which you can't do anything. It's very important to understand 
that Joe Madison used that platform to bring and convene us when and where he entered, everyone entered with him. And then intergenerationally passing the baton to people who have been training to receive the baton before he ever met them, like a Karen Hunter, like a Roland Mark. It's very important to understand. Everybody now has a platform with wildly uneven content. And the illusion is that you are making choices as to what to look at. You're not making choices. This is... Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, come on. This is a book I really do want to share with everyone because I mentioned it and I had it out of reach um, when I talked about it last week. And now I could have sworn I put it somewhere. Y'all know I'm going to look for it until I find it. But let me see what I did with it. It's going to take me a second here because I think I got so. Uh, uh, here it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> Filter World. <laughs> Filter World. It's very important to, to look at this book. Filter World, How Algorithms Flattened Culture. This is uh, Kyle Kaka, right? Um, he is a staff writer at The New Yorker. Very interesting. I'll just read a little bit to you. He says, from twin trendy restaurants to city grids to TikTok and Netflix feeds the world round Algorithmic recommendations dictate our experiences and choices. The algorithm is present in the familiar neon signs and exposed brick of internet cafes, whether in Nairobi or Portland, and the skeletal modern furniture of Airbnbs in cities big and small. Over the last decade, this network of mathematically determined decisions has taken over, almost unnoticed, informing the songs we listen to, the friends with whom we stay in touch, as we've grown increasingly accustomed to our insipid new normal. This ever-tightening web woven by algorithms is called filter world. Ch Ch uh, Kyle Chaka shows us how online and offline spaces alike have been engineered for seamless consumption, becoming a source of pervasive anxiety in the process. Users of technology have been forced to contend with data-driven equations that try to anticipate their desires and often get them wrong. What results is a state of docility that allows tech companies to curtail human experiences, human lives for profit. But to have our tastes, behaviors, and emotions governed by computers while convenient does nothing short of call the very notion of free will into question. We have to click, like, share, subscribe to Narrative on YouTube. We have to listen to all the platforms that emerges on as nubia came into existence as a result as the social media as the as the convening space the social conversation space connected to narrative which came into existence to create a space where we could have these kind of conversations and have access to and contribute to this this archive and this living conversation this living repository that would be out of that stream we have to constantly be aware that the vast majority of our people as jacob or others used to say we talk about the african-centered school movement the vast majority of our children in the public schools and as we talk about that, we understand that the vast majority of our people are being assaulted like every other human on the planet with this world, this incredible curated consumer driven world called filter world, as he calls it. And in that process, we have been standing that Joe Madison came along when it was a very different kind of filtering going on before technology took that quantum leap and the social structure gatekeepers whether it be a solution Grange at a Universal Music Group, whether it be uh, any of these other folks who are making these choices and making it making us try to think like it's our choices, you know, Clyde Taylor who made transition a few uh, couple of, uh, a week ago, almost a little bit over a week ago, Clyde Taylor in the Mask of Art calls it the art culture complex. Our tastes have been curated, but one thing about water, if you drink enough of it, it will help you reset, and that's what we're doing here. And so, Joe Madison, we ring this bell for you, brother, as you join the ancestors. And we know that you put it where the goats can get it. As one of those goats who ate some of what you put down, I want you to know that uh, as from one goat to another goat, but except you, greatest of all time, goat. Thank you, brother. And thank you for leaving us well-equipped with the Karen Hunters of the world to have someone and have people whose vibe attracted their tribe 
and who now are about that work of principal sacrifice till we get to liberation. Ah, Shay. All right. I'm coming in. Um, I was also thinking, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All of the, the wonderful comments in both chats. Uh, and by the way, the YouTube, uh, people, uh, I, I see, I see the Nubians in there and <laughs> let me look over here. <laughs> yes. So, and, and what's powerful about that? You know, when we first started this journey, we were on YouTube and Nubia was created because it was like such a filthy element of mm -hmm. uh, just disruption and hate that was coming through when we're having this dialogue. And I, you know, we had some moderators. We couldn't even keep up with it. At one point I had to turn off the chat and I was I like, well, I, I never want to be in a situation where we are distracted by people whose job it is to kill, steal, and destroy. So we needed to have, and Nubia came about as a reaction to that. Yes. But now we're back and the chat looks very similar to Nubia because you, <laughs> you teach people how to treat you and you set boundaries and rules of engagement. And that's a response is active responsibility. Just as it, you just held up that book, which I'm going to be reading filter world. We have to be intentional about what we ingest who we uh, commune with and how we gather people, you know, we have to let folk know what is and is not acceptable in our spaces. So yes. um, we have power to do that. That's our power. So I, yes. I want to say thank you uh, to the thank people uh, for, for making that possible and make all yes. spaces where we are palatable for all of us. You, you know, you don't have to agree, you know, but get in line with getting, a, get in alignment with, with freedom and power for all and agree to agree on right. the things we can agree to. And throughout the rest, you ain't got to comment on everything. It's okay. Um, and bad. on another note, as, as we honor Joe Madison with our time and energy and our work, you know, I was also, as you were talking about Roland, showing up with the cameras. That's his ministry. You know, we all have our ministry. You know, you know my, thing, my thing is what I do. I'm not necessarily going to be out. On, I'm definitely not going to be showing up on everybody. <laughs> I'm, right, I'm not going right. to be in the street. It's not my thing. Dr. Carr may be in them streets. That's his yeah. ministry. He may be out there competing yeah. with the people. We all have the thing that we are going to do. And, and there's no competition in that because no. my ministry is not yours, even no. though we come together to do this thing, which makes that's magic, actually, because that's what alchemy is, right? The elements right. coming together. But your element has to be proper. You don't get H2O unless the H and the, and the O are solid, right? Well, they're not solid. Some of them are gases, but you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, yes. I'm going to be my H, you're going to be your O, and together we're going to pour a clean glass of water, but it can, cannot happen unless we're both be in our own in our own element. So mm -hmm. uh, that's the challenge for all of you, uh, whether mm -hmm. you have a platform, and everyone has a platform because you have a life and you have people in it. So that's your platform. You know, make sure you are providing people with, with the wholeness so that when we come together, there's nothing but magic. And yes. it's why I never even have to plan, like, you know, being in a community with a Dr. Black that you brought to the table or Dr. No. Senyata. I never even have to plan for those because I know <laughs> he's coming, she's coming, I'm coming together. It's going to be magic for the people who are listening and it never fails. So just like Saturdays, we don't, we don't have a pre-session. We don't no. plan this. No. Um, half the time I don't even know what we're gonna talk about, but you now are sending me titles, so I was like, Oh, this is gonna be good, it's gonna be good. I just never uh, we do talk, but you're right because we yes. know we, we know, know and what today is. this is your man. I mean, I don't, I don't want to belabor that point, but, but it's very important, you know, when you know somebody, when you've worked with them, and just listening to you talk about it, you say he made, he made the way for me, and I'm making the way for I mean, that's a different thing. People, most people that we encounter, we can't encounter in person because they lived a long time ago. Harriet Tubman, or you know, Fred Douglas, or or Hatshepsut, or but this was this is a different relationship when you work with somebody. That's a very different thing. We, you, you know, I think about what Miss Bethune said about Carter Woodson. She said, "I loved Carter Woodson, but I don't grieve for him because I know that on that April day he left us. He went to join." the ranks of great servants of humanity whose leadership is timeless. She said, I will always love him. He he helped me maintain faith in myself. This is somebody not writing as one giant about another giant. This is a woman, a man who had a, a close relate. Mary McLeod Bethune showed up on a garbage dump. There are still graduating children from Bethune-Cookman. So when you talk about Joe Madison, you know, 
Yes, I understand, but that's a relationship. That's why even when you posted that short clip on YouTube that I watched an excerpt, you could see, okay, I'm holding this together. I'm good, but there's an emotion there. That is the feeling that that those Africans in Mali show Asa Hilliard. Yeah, you can look at the books. You can scan all the books, but these are the people, brother. We didn't show him that because he came in here wrong. <laughs> so therefore, you know, I don't trust you. People know when you're a good person. And as a good person, and I don't, I'm not making a moral judgment or a value judgment. I'm saying based on the work you have done. Goodness. Thank you, Professor Hunter. And thank you for sharing with us a little of that relationship you had with Joe Madison. Because that's that's modeling what we must aspire to. And you're welcome. I'm, I'm learning to do that. Yeah. But also, yes. um, we're both similar in this, that we put our heads down uh and continue to do what we've been doing you know yeah. uh when your mom made transition you know we were talking about i didn't think you were going to be in on a saturday but you were here because that's the honoring of the life so that the life continues and it continues through us so um thank you thank you for holding space i just want to the eagle has landed how do we fly without perching did we answer that how do we fly how do we fly without perching dr community Carl? Community, sacrifice, preparation, realizing that none of us can do anything by ourselves. Um, you, know, uh, you know, a bird can't fly with one wing. And so, you know, Joe Madison didn't fly by itself. In fact, there's a Joe Madison because of everything. Again, folks, if y'all pick up radioactive, you'll see Joe Madison's going to name as many people as he can. And every time you would see Joe Madison, I know, see, you worked with him. It's a different relationship. I knew him in the streets. You see him with Bobby Dick Gregory or you'd be around talking with him. You know, Joe Madison was the kind of guy, always very self-effacing, always very yeah. humble. And you could leave there like, and that was Joe Madison. But you don't think about that. It's like, this is just some good dude who's like pushing you. Also, also very dapper. Gonna show he's gonna show up looking and smelling good. So we did a we did a um an urban view vote uh voter registration drive at HBCUs in 2018. And you know, I'm always with these big ideas, you know. We're gonna do we're gonna do this thing like we have urban view gives right now. Um, and so I reached out to him. We we did a thing at Morehouse, he sway and I we did a town hall, which basically I was just moderating, letting jo but Joe came in he brought john carlos who showed up you know like wow. the people the people that he impacted is so like you're gonna you're gonna be seeing this over the next couple of years probably um and we're gonna keep uh his best ofs running probably through the end of the month but you know i was like wow you know i had never met you know all he saw him you know at that mexico city on okay. that on that podium and he was there he came there for joe I remember an interview he did with Patty Austin, one of the best interviews. I, you know, I grew up listening to Patty Austin, but their relationship, <laughs> that interview, though, I'm, I'm, I'm going to reach out to see if they could replay that. I was, I was driving in the car like I couldn't get out the car listening to that interview. It was so powerful, but that interview could only happen because you know Joe Madison had a relationship with Patty Austin. Facts. That was a deep relationship. And that's what's required. You can't just come in out of left field, out of journalism school, whatever, sit down and start asking questions. This is not something that you can go research with a notebook. This is life lived experience. And if you don't have it, that's fine. Wait, it's okay. Have patience, develop those relationships. But Joe Madison existed because of his life experiences and his relationships. And it's the reason why no one person can fill those shoes. No you know, we all have our, our journey, but we honor him with that work. So that's, that's, I just want to say that. Right. No, no. Somebody, somebody said in the Nubia chat and I scrolled up there that birds fly in formation. So that community is so important. Oh, and, yeah. and, and Maureen over in the, uh, Maureen Puckerin over in the YouTube chat said, Joe Madison introduced me to professor Hunter. I live him and her. This is my family. So, I mean, you're raising this. I mean, this is a thing. Now, I don't know whether you can confirm this or not. I remember reading it and I heard him say, Joe Madison was the fifth top. The four tops in the fifth. In other words, like he had a whole music thing. That's what they, he claimed. I mean, you know, the, the four tops. He was like, I mean, the man was cold. Yes, he was cold with it, right? Yeah. So, and, and of course, I we, we, I we will end with this because we going on. But I have to mention this. Anytime I would tune in, and of course, he had that square jar and everything else. 
you better come correct. Y'all share that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Joe Madison, I'll be like, oh, 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 no. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. I, I feel so bad for the people calling up rambling. Yo. You feel bad? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I have my own way, but my yes, goodness, <laughs> my goodness, Lamont, Lamont King was oh, yeah. on the show yesterday and he, you know, he used to be in radio. He was on with Russ Park for a long time and they <laughs> shared a building because they were in at um, Kathy Hughes's um, platform, right? Yeah. And uh, Joe, Joe Madison had a studio. He said they used to hang outside the studio just to hear what Joe Madison was saying and then bring it back to their to their show. But he said he was in a parking lot and Joe Madison had gotten into a fight with another host. Fist fight. He said it was one of them old school, you know, where somebody got their ass whooped. They were tired. They sat on the curb. The man who got his ass whooped by Joe Madison pulled out a flask afterwards and sh they shared a drink. And you think about, <laughs> think about people, people don't do, you know, like, all right, we have a beef. I'm going to whoop your ass. It's and then we're going to sit right. down and we good. We good. If we ain't going to talk about it no more, here, have a drink. But, you know, we 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 have all these uh, manufactured beefs and everybody's so offended. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, can we, can we can bring settle. That back? Can yes. we bring that back? Yes, we need, to. Let's have a drink. we need to bring let's that Have a drink. Back. Hug it out. Hug it out. And let's move on and keep keep working. He was like, Lamont was like, that was the, the most beautiful and he's like, you know, and, and to have witness to that, you know, he saw that with his own eyes. I was like, <laughs> that was the best story yesterday. Food since Friday, one of the best. So yes, indeed. Oh man, well, thank you, Prof. We were go, we've gone on, but I mean, this this legend needed that. I know you're gonna be paying tribute to him on and on. Yeah, and just, we have. Uh, there's gonna be a special. Uh, his family's gonna be participating in on Wednesday, uh, and and I've I've introduced the the notion of doing. Uh, a duplicate of his telethon uh, to raise money for prostate cancer for yeah. the 82 hours, but we all have to participate because no one person could do the, the 82 hours, but, no and it, it should be across, but we'll see what Sirius XM does. Uh, that's my contribution, but we'll see what happens and um, rest I'll in power. His wife, uh, to his wife, Sherry and to the family. Sherry, yes. Yeah. Shona yeah. Renee. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So we'll, we'll, um, I'm sure, I don't know that, they, I mean, I imagine they will probably stream the service. I mean, I can't imagine, but you know, so we'll get a chance to at least share the ritual from a distance. But um, yeah. much love to you. We all love you, you, and and thank you for you know. This is a yeah. <laughs> anyway, so mm, mm, mm. love you so, too. Love everybody. Yeah. See everybody. The office hour in the new year. Yes, finish Du Bois uh, on Monday night. That's going to be something. So y'all yeah, don't want to miss that. Uh, and yes. And Sunday, I think it's Maroon's Medicine Chest tomorrow. Maroon's yep. Medicine Chest. Yes. 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 Yeah. In fact, right. I just got another order of uh, the calming uh, hibiscus from her, the, the ginger hibiscus, you know. she makes Sorrel. You got the sorrel. Yes. 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 Jamaican yes. ginger sorrel. You already know. You know what? See, it's good to be a legal drug pusher. See, that's the good drug. Yeah. She is. Anyway. She got me through he got me through my little cold with that. I was like, oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Senyata. You. Thank you. All right. And thank you. Thank you, Joe Madison. Thank you. Love you, Dr. Carr. Thank you, Joe. There he is. Yes, indeed. Love you.